Hello, everyone, and greetings from Michigan. Welcome to this case study on setting up an AR and VR infrastructure for a large organization. My name is Matt Curtin, and I'm the Senior Director of Technology and Visual Design at Innovative Learning Group. Before we dive in, just a little bit about ILG. We're a performance first learning company, and we have been in business for 18 years, founded in 2004 by our owner and CEO, Lisa Tunagas. We have more than 175 clients and 35 industries. And we're also a certified women's business enterprise, a fact that's becoming more important to many of the organizations we work with as they look to increase diversity amongst their suppliers and vendors. A few additional notes. Please chime in at any time during this session with questions or comments that you might have using the chat feature. If you're not familiar with Zoom, this is located at the bottom of your screen. You may have to scroll all the way down to make this feature visible. Immediately following the webinar, you're going to get an email with a link to a short survey. As learning people, we love to get your feedback. We are recording this session, and early next week, you'll receive the YouTube link along with the slide deck. I'd also like to introduce one of ILG's programmers, Walter Schurmacher. Hey, Walter. Hello, everyone. So um, Walter is not only a programmer at ILG, but he's also my co-host on the podcast, Let's Talk Learning Technology, or as we affectionately refer to it, LT Squared. Walter's gonna be monitoring the chat to help with any technical issues you have or call my attention to any questions. Thank you, Walter. So this presentation is going to start with clarifying the challenges of missing AR and VR infrastructure. AR, of course, stands for augmented reality and VR for virtual reality. As within anything for the um, technology, there could be a lot of acronyms. So if I mention one later that you don't recognize and I don't describe it, feel free to ask in the chat. I don't want to have jargon or acronyms leaving people confused. I would also like to get a sense of how much you might already know about AR and VR for learning. So while I'm getting started here, please enter in the chat if you've tried AR and VR learning solutions, or if you've just tried AR and VR in general, or whether you're actively using them in your organization, just looking to collect a little bit about your experience. Um, as you're getting started on that, um, I'm going to be throughout the presentation referring to a case study based on setting up the technology infrastructure for aseptic clean room training that learners take in VR. My presentation today is going to describe and document the technology choices made for the aseptic clean room VR training, but I'm also going to cover the pros and cons of other options that could have been chosen if the facts of the scenario are different. My goal there is to make sure that the information will be relevant for all organizations. Before I describe the clean room training further, I want to make difference, uh, make clear the difference between AR and VR, because it is something that I've seen a lot of people get confused on. In the picture on the left, there's an example of augmented reality, and I'm going to uh, zoom in here, and you can see in the background is the real world. And the person looking through the iPad has additional information that the AR is popping up for them. So they can see that the order that they're getting ready to pick is highlighted in green and it's showing the time that it should be picked up. O over in the lower right corner, you can see the directions for where they need to go to get to that pallet and how, how long it's going to take for them to walk there. And a little bit harder to see in the background, there's other some pop ups for the um, times for pickup for other items that are, are, are in the background. So really with AR, you're looking at the real world, you're adding additional information to it that's going to allow you to do your job easier. Then on the right hand side, we're looking at virtual reality. And here with virtual reality, instead of seeing the real world and other things superimposed, everything you see when you're in the headset, because your view of the real world is blocked, everything you see is virtual, which means that this is going to be a place that you can practice and train and get better at things and then come back to the real world and do the job better. We're going to cycle back to the differences between AR and VR a little bit later when we get to the headsets that you might choose. So I'm seeing some things coming in from the chat about um, not using AR or VR yet for training, um, some pursuing, um, some testing but not yet implemented, and then 
not using but pursuing. So I think um, that's a pretty good smattering of what we see from most of our clients, which is a lot of interest, but not a whole lot of strategic use yet. So for, from the case study, the clean room virtual reality training, it is going to be virtual reality training, not augmented reality that we're talking about. And the, in the virtual reality, the learner is going to have the headset on, their view blocked, they're going to be holding controllers in each of their hands that can track where their hands are moving. And the training is all about making sure that the learner does things to keep the clean room sterile. So this is a place where they're making vaccines and any kind of contamination at all could ruin the, the vaccine batch and they would have to dispose of it. The logic and the VR application is going to know things like if the learner is walking too fast, which would stir up air and have the potential for contamination. Or if they're holding their hands in the wrong position, they need to hold their hands upright in a certain way to help keep it clean. It could also alert them to things like when the gloves need to be disinfected, what to do if a glove tears, like what's the right protocol, and lots of other things to protect the sterility of the clean room. One of the benefits of doing this through VR training is that it really feels like you are there doing it. So you're really getting practice instead of just in a traditional e-learning, maybe learning knowledge about it. You really are practicing. And another thing that you might ask is, okay, well, if we could practice this in VR better than e-learning, why not just practice it in the real clean room? And there's a couple of issues there. One is that the clean room needs to be operational so much of the time that any time that you're taking it down um, for, for training, it, it, it's offline and you can't produce the product you need to produce. So they really can't take it down just because of training. It's more like they have to schedule the training in between batches when it's already down and those time frames could be short. The other issue is, is that the focus of this is so much on keeping the clean room sterile and going in there to do training. If you're not really an expert, then you're introducing things that might not make it sterile there and kind of the opposite of the purpose of this training to keep it clean. So those are a couple of reasons why virtual reality is going to be helpful here. So what is it that typically makes AR or VR significantly harder to implement than typical e-learning? It's more than just the technical skills for designing and developing the AR or VR experience. To make this clear, I need to talk about development in general and see how it fits into the overall learning strategy. So you see here two ends of the path. At the beginning of the path is the vision, and at the far end down that path is the implementation plan. This is at the vision is the high level view of what we want to accomplish and why we want to accomplish it. And when we reach the implementation plan off in the distance there, when we get to that marker, we'll have determined how we're gonna fulfill that vision and we'll have broken it up into the specific steps that we need in order to tackle it to get the job done. But we can't just jump from here to there. We have a lot of intermediate steps that we need to go through. So we need to consider our audience and their macro learning needs. We need to think about what is the best way to deliver training for these needs. We don't want to develop, uh, design and develop for AR or VR just because they're a choice. We want to make sure it would be the right choice before we pick it. If we do determine the AR or VR are right solution, what's going to be the best, best way to procure it? Would we build it or buy it off the shelf or contract it out for custom development? And then what technology be, would be used to develop, deliver, and track the solution? How will we know if the learners are really learning any new knowledge and skills from it? So that would be assessment and evaluation. And then from the organizational structure, do we have the right people on our team, the right roles to support the learning initiative if we do go and use a new technology that we haven't used? And from there, we can go on to the implementation plan. But when the request comes in for us to develop AR and VR, um, oftentimes the focus is primarily on that technology and infrastructure part, and maybe a little bit on the development tools that we're going to use, maybe on the how we're going to distribute it, uh, things that fall into that category. The request is generally, we think we have a good use case for AR or VR. We need your help designing and develop it. But then if the other things aren't really in place for AR and VR up and down this path, then we really have to go and revisit both earlier and later on the path to make sure that AR and VR is really gonna work out. 
if you f find that that support isn't available, then I, I liken this more to a trip to the moon than a stroll down a, a mountain path. Now, I'm not saying that developing AR or VR is nearly as difficult as landing on the moon, really, but sometimes it can feel like it when you start in and you realize all these other pieces aren't established or settled yet. We're going to consider today things like how realistic does the AR or VR experience need to be? Um, what types of hardware do we need? So uh, we're going to pick a fancier or a less fancy headset. Do we need hand tracking? Do we need eye tracking or other things that we might need? And simply how many headsets are we going to need based on how many people need to be trained and how fast are we going to need a few headsets or a lot? Then what types of development tools could be used to create the experience? And once we've um, developed them, how do we roll them out to the headsets? How do we get those AR or VR experiences out to the headsets or the glasses after they're released? So here's one of those acronyms, App Distribution and Mobile Device Management, or MDM. Mobile device management is used on mobile phones now and tablets so that organizations can push out apps to their users who are supposed to have them. And we need the same sort of thing for AR and VR. Next is going to be the tracking approach. And what kind of uh, tools are we going to use to track what's happening in the AR or VR experiences and figure out whether learners are successfully completing the operations or any questions or quizzes they might need to take? And then how are we going to do reporting and dashboards? I want to draw one more comparison between traditional e-learning and AR VR solutions. And I, when I do a learning technology strategy, I tend to think of it these things for all types of learning that need technology components. So I divide at the top level between standardized systems and standalone systems. In a standardized system, the parts are interchangeable so that you could obtain, distribute, and track from interchangeable pieces. And then, so for example, you could use a, a one kind of authoring tool and no matter what one you pick there, if it follows those standards, distribute it on your LMS or via a portal and then track in your learning management system. In a standalone system, the vendor provides all three of these functions, obtain, distribute, and track. And often in a, it's gonna be in a turnkey fashion so that you don't have to use any of these standardized systems. Uh, often, though, it's going to be in a proprietary way where it's not compatible with these systems, although sometimes you may develop, uh, obtain, distribute, track in this way and still be able, for instance, to loop back behind the scenes and track information to your learning management system. So if, if we look at that standardized systems for traditional e-learning, you're probably going to find in your organization there's already some standards for the authoring tool. It might be something like Storyline or Rise or, or Captivate or others. And there's a, a SCORM compliant or AICC compliant learning management system that learners could use to find the courses that we're developing, or we could use to assign to learners plans so that they know they need to take something. And then we can track to the learning management system and get reports from the learning management system. So we're pretty good in pretty good shape there for traditional e-learning in most organizations. And on top of that, we know that there will be IT standards that will say what types of devices that we need to track to, laptops, tablets, and phones perhaps, and what browsers. And e even if the um, solution that you have is it's like a bring your own device and it's not necessarily particular tablets or phones at least you know that's the policy but you might find in um, AR and VR solutions that there isn't even a policy about what types of headsets could be used so in the comparison to AR or VR what we generally find in most cases at least at this time still is that it isn't clear what kind of development tools should be used. It isn't clear how the experiences could be distributed to learners because there isn't in place and there isn't a tracking system that's good for AR or VR. And as I mentioned a minute ago, we don't have an idea about what headsets or it's very fragmented because lots of different headsets are in use instead of a standard. All right, now let's take a look at the standalone systems. 
For, so for other types besides AR and VR, a lot of times you'll find standardized systems for the, or standalone systems for things like artificial intelligence or coaching and mentoring um, or serious games and simulations, because these are things that are not easily deployed through a traditional learning management system. And so they need their kind of own siloed system for dealing with it. The other case that you might find for these standalone systems are things like content libraries, but by that I mean like off the shelf e learning that you might get in bulk or video distribution that have their own kind of channels outside of your regular learning management system for delivering. So the next question is how do these fare for AR and VR? So there are systems for deploying um, electronic work instructions or SOPs through AR where the standalone system provides a way to author those instructions that are going to go to the learner and they could be displayed in the glasses or headset step by step for the learner to use. But I think you're going to find that very few companies are likely to be using the, those right now compared to the number of companies that are using learning management systems. When it comes to standalone systems for D VR delivery. There are off the shelf content libraries for things like compliance training, um, you, you might think like lockout tag out working at heights. Some of these are more interactive than others, it, but the main point with that would be that they're going to be helpful if that off the shelf kind of VR is good for you, but not so useful if you want to train something custom. So that tells me we've kind of gone through a look of all the standardized and standalone systems. And most often with most clients, we realize we are on that spot where we need to go back and do a strategic evaluation of how we're going to make AR and VR work. So let's continue on this journey, starting with the level of realism. So we've made that path from the mountain up to the moon and we've got these robots helping us here. Um, with the level of realism, what does that even mean? It could have to do with how it looks or how it sounds when you're in the experience or whether maybe there's artificial intelligence controlling the avatars. But it really came down to us a couple of things before we could go further down the chain and pick up what headset. Um, we needed to know how realistic does it need to look to be effective and what interactions do we need to be able to support so you can really practice the things you need to practice in the VR experience. So we considered four different levels of graphic realism. The first level is 2D graphics or video. This could be just flat graphics that could be embedded in the experience. So they wouldn't appear as 3D like everything else in the virtual reality experience, but they might be on a panel that appears inside the VR experience. It could, an example here would be a graphic of an operator showing how you're supposed to hold your hands so that we could put that together with the narration and the text that appears in the experience to help explain how you're supposed to hold your hands. This is the simplest level of graphics and you're going to see as I continue through these cards that um, over in the right hand corner there's going to be a number of dollar signs indicated from one dollar sign up to two, three, up to four dollar signs and it's just a relative indication of the cost. So this is the, the least costly accepting free, which we might see in some cases. Next are stock 3D models. These might be things like a table or a chair or a bench or a cart that could be purchased from an online store, such as the Unity Asset Store or a 3D model store like Turbo Squid. And these would be things that maybe you would be able to purchase from that store, import it into the code for your VR experience and use as is. The prices could vary, but sometimes you could get um, whole packs of assets uh, with hundreds of items in them for like 20 or $30. So cost for stock 3D models that don't have to be modified is very low as well. Next are modified stock 3D models. And this would be if you started from the same type of stock 3D models from an asset store, but then we customize them to make them more realistic to fit our needs. So what you might want to think about here is, is, okay, we can get a cart from the stock asset store, but the cart does not look like the cart in our aseptic clean room. And so we need to have the 3D modeler make some adjustments to it so that it really will fit our needs. 
Um, in some cases, for the sterility assurance, it had to do with taking something that it was a material that looked plasticky, but otherwise the shape was right. And we changed that material to be stainless steel to be easier to clean as it would be in a real clean room. And then finally, for the graphics, we come to custom models or animations created from scratch to support the training. So this could be things like an isolator or a RABS, which is a remote access barrier system, uh, matching what's used by the organization. That remote access barrier system, you might have seen something like this in pictures sometimes. It's the thing where the, even though you're already gowned and have on goggles and have on two pairs of gloves before you can deal with the stuff inside the system, you also have to put your hands through the gloves that are built into that glass wall because just having two pairs of gloves is not enough to prevent infection in the grade A area where you're really working on the product. And um, those systems, um, you're not liable to find stock assets that match what you need, um, so you can build those from scratch. The other spot um, that we use this is for um, a model of an avatar operator, and we use this at the spot where we're getting ready to test that the learner is not walking too fast in the clean room. We actually have an animated operator that walks at the speed that you're supposed to walk at, and you as a learner can walk beside them, and if you walk fast and faster than they are, you're going to get a warning, and otherwise you're good, you're walking at the right speed if you're walking the speed at the speed of that avatar or slower. All right, so next we're going to look into the hardware selection and how to pick which kind of headset to use. So we're going to return to that discussion about the differences between AR and VR. And looking at these devices, we should be able to tell which are which from what we talked about before, about that idea of whether they're blocking the real world or not. So here you see the um, Quest headset and the HTC Vive headset. And it's clear that you won't be able to see through and see the real world. So those are going to be virtual reality devices. Then you have some glasses on this side, one where it was going to have something to put um, AR content in your field of view, but you can see through one where it just is going to put something over one eye and the other eye you can see through. So those you could see through and see the real world. And then also the tablet here, where in the tablet, um, unlike these where it's going to be a glasses or headset that you're going to wear, you're going to hold the tablet and point it at things, and you're going to see the real world through its camera and some other things added in, so that also falls into the AR category. Now, this split between the AR and VR like that is going to lead to a natural division, a natural division between AR and VR about whether it's good for performance support or good for training. Because AR, you really want to have it help you while you're the worker doing the job. And VR, you're going to have it help you get better, smarter, more practice before you come back and do the job. There can be some crossover in some cases where people are doing training using AR, for example where you see the real world and you have some equipment that you want to practice on, and that's a 3D model projected into the real world. But it's more like VR, even if it's on AR glasses, if you're not really using it to do anything with the real world, you're just using the virtual parts of it. If you if um, still questions about the difference between AR and VR, put them into the chat as we go. Because while it seems pretty straightforward, it does seem to be the type of thing that continues to confuse people for a while. I'm going to move ahead and look at some real world examples of AR choices. And so um, that AR, it could be from the uh, smartphone or the tablet. Um, it could be from a low end headset. So this is the uh, Mira Prism. The Mira Prism is where you would take a, a smartphone and you would stick it in here and it has a mirror and it allows it to work almost like the Google Cardboard where you slip a phone in and it's what's providing the processing power. But with that, you can see the real world and other elements created by the smartphone. And then on the right side here, um, this is one example of a higher end headset. This is music smart glasses. 
but not pictured here is the Microsoft HoloLens, which is quite um, bigger looking. It still lets you see the real world through glasses, but it would cover up a lot more of your head. So this kind of one-eyed set is going to be good where mostly you're seeing the real world and you're getting just a step-by-step -step instruction. The field of view of what gets projected into your view may be very small, just big enough to see next instructions for what you could do. If we were looking at that hollow lens, um, you'd see where, because it covers much more of your field of view, you can get um, other objects, 3D objects inserted in anywhere into most of your view instead of just in a corner, like some of these ones that are just meant to give step-by-step -step instructions. So where does augmented reality make sense? It's gonna make sense whenever workers can do their job more effectively or more efficiently with augmented reality than with other forms of performance support. At the low end, augmented reality might be just popping in those instructions, do this next, do this next, do this next, and keep your hands free maybe so that you're not having to hold or look at work instructions as you do your job. At the higher end, in addition to getting those steps, you may get um, instructions popping up that include videos or 3D models that go into your field of view showing you how to do something. You may also get the case where at the real equipment that you're looking at, it pops up and overlays arrows and captions and things on that equipment that show you what to do on the equipment, maybe that you're trying to repair or inspect. And then Augmented reality also, because it already has that camera looking at the work you're trying to do at the higher end, maybe middle to higher end, you, you have this idea of having web conferencing with a remote coach. So if you get stuck on the step-by-step -step instructions and you need help, you can call out for help. The remote co coach who might have expertise can actually see what you're doing as you're doing the job through the camera on the device. They could take a snapshot of it and then mark it up and then send it back into your field of view, or they could chat with you via voice over the headset and give you next instructions. So very, very powerful. Um, you can see in the middle part of the slide here, some of the fields that are likely to use this. Next, uh, moving into virtual reality delivery methods. So you could take that phone and flip it into a Google Cardboard. And you, the, uh, if you already have the phone, um, the expense is extremely minimal to get to the low end VR. Then you have the mid range headsets. Um, you can see the picture says Oculus and we say MetaQuest here too. With Facebook becoming Meta, they have rebranded the headsets from Oculus Quest 2 to MetaQuest 2. Uh, these headsets do not need to be connected by a cord to a computer. They operate on their own. And then the high-end headset like the HTC Vive um, does require being connected to a computer. And the benefit of that, the drawback, of course, is being connected by the cable. But the benefit of that is, is that you can get more realistic looking graphics and more processing power there. And um, Interestingly, the Quest headset also allows you to optionally use a cable. So if you run out of processing power using it standalone mode, you can connect it to a computer by a cable to get more processing power. So when does virtual reality make sense? So virtual reality um, is going to make sense in some of these fields, healthcare, manufacturing, military, law enforcement, sales. Um, because there are places, these are places oftentimes where it's dangerous to practice or cannot afford to fail. If you're training on something and you don't know how to do it well, and um, someone could die or become injured because you hadn't practiced enough, then it might, it makes sense to use virtual reality. Also, if it's expensive to simulate or uh, costly to take the equipment offline, as we talked about for the clean room training, if it's bulky to move equipment around, like the equipment is located in another country and you wanna be trained on it here, if there's a benefit from repeating over and over and over again, or from role player immersion. Um, and another one on here, um, it would be um, similar to bulky move equipment, but what if the equipment isn't built yet? So um, a number of requests um, that I've been involved with about 
We're getting ready to build a new factory and it's not going to be done until X time, but we want to start training them on people on it before it's done. Well, obviously you can't practice in the real um, location if the location does not exist yet. So we're going to um, step through again and kind of look at some of the powers and weaknesses of some of these headsets. So the nice thing about the phone is that lowest cost and minimal configuration. Um, you can pop it into the Google Cardboard type of device and start using it, but the drawback is going to be limited interactivity. So you may hear people use the term three degrees of freedom or three DOF versus six degrees of freedom or six DOF. So three degrees of freedom means that you can look around, but you can't walk around. So with phone VR, if, if you put on that into a Google Cardboard and look, you can look around every direction, up, down, left, and right, but it doesn't update if you walk around. Next are going to be some of the lower end headsets, like um, what was the Oculus Go or the Samsung Gear VR. These headsets are by and large disappearing from future development because the mid-range ones like the MetaQuest have come down so low in price that there's not much room in the market yet for these low-end headsets. But essentially, they're a bit more powerful than the phones, not as powerful as the mid-range, but they, they work without a phone and they have their own processing power in the headset. Um, and, and these ones um, still only typically get you to three degrees of freedom, ability to look around but not walk around. And in the case of some of them, you can hold kind of a virtual laser pointer in your hand so that you could point at things and answer questions. But with this type of headset, you're not likely to be able to, in the virtual environment, pick things up and carry them around like you could at the mid-range and higher. This mid-range headset is probably going to be in the sweet spot for general usage within a lot of organizations. It's not necessarily going to serve the highest needs with the most interactivity and the fancy graphics, but they do allow you to look, look around and walk around. They do allow you to pick things up. They do allow you to have networking with uh, multi-participants so that more than one person can be networked in across the internet in the same virtual space working together on things. These mid-range headsets have what's called inside-out tracking which means that unlike some of the higher end headsets, you don't have to set up external equipment called base stations to track where you are moving around. The cameras on the headset actually can keep track of where you are. And again, a very nice benefit on these headsets that you don't have to be connected to that cable. One, it's just more convenient not to be having that um, cable, but also from a safety standpoint, if you have people who are gonna be new learners and they're, they haven't used VR before, it's a little bit of a tripping hazard to have the cable behind you unless you go through putting up like a special overhead mount for keeping the cable above you. So not having that cable is better. And just in setup time, because if you would take one of these headsets from one training area to another and set up in a new room, probably in three to four minutes, you can set up the space to be able to have the headset track where you are in the new location. With, with one of these standalone mid-range headsets. And with some of the higher end headsets, um, which I'm headed to next, it can take 30 to minutes to maybe an hour and a half to set up, depending on the complexity of the headset. You gotta set up the base stations, you've gotta connect the headset to the base stations and connect the headset to the computer, have the computer set up. Um, moving that equipment around is much more difficult than with the mid-range. Um, the advantages of the high-end headset, you can get to more realistic looking graphics because you can get a fancy desktop computer and then pump up to a higher end graphics card. And the higher the graphics card, the more that your development tool is going to be able to make it look more and more realistic um, up to kind of the Hollywood movie style effects. Um, so you will notice if you go from one of these high-end headsets to a mid-range like the MetaQuest, that the graphics are not quite as real, but the graphics are real enough for training many things at that mid-range. All right, turning to AR, at the lowest end is that uh, phone that you're gonna be able to hold and it has a smaller screen space. But 
Um, while the tablet is bigger, which would let you see more, it also has a drawback that it's more cumbersome to carry than a phone. So if you're holding one of those in your hand while you're trying to do work, the phone might be better than the tablet from that point of view of just less cumbersome to carry. Uh, next, a low end headset. So um, low end headset gets you the benefit that you're hands free. You could use both hands to do the job, but it's going to be um, more costly than just a phone or tablet and still not as powerful as the high end AR. And then the high end um, AR headset hands free most powerful processing and capability and drawback you can see we're now up to four dollar signs here can be quite expensive. Um, one thing about AR is is that it's not as far advanced. It hasn't been a, around as long and widespread use as virtual reality. So um, we're pretty close to a turning point on AR of more devices coming. Um, things like the HoloLens is at version two, and there's a new version for Magic Leap coming, and uh, Apple and Meta waiting in the wings to release some things in AR. One of the um, things of, that keeps the AR is uh, from, being far advanced as VR is really just the processing power that it takes is relatively the same, but the device has to be smaller for AR. You've got to be able to see through it, and the processing power and the heat means that the glasses are going to get too hot. Like you don't um, want to be wearing glasses on your face and they get way too hot and are burning your skin. So um, some things that you could see there to overcome that problem. Um, one is just continued improving technology, but it's taking a while. Another is where you might wear glasses that are the size of regular glasses, and they're connect through, connected through a cable to something that you wear on your belt or in your pocket or in, uh, in a backpack, that, that it can get some of the processing power away from the glasses. And then another one um, that's um, a, a little bit um, less likely to be used or has been historically less likely to be used is a VR headset where you don't see through and see the real world at all. But as the cameras get better, like if you, if you take the typical um, Quest headset right now, when you're setting up the boundary, you can look through and see the real world, but the cameras are black and white only and kind of grainy and the view is a little shaky. But as they're making those cameras better, they could make it so that you could have that your view completely blocked. But because of what they're pulling in through the cameras on the headset, they can show you the real world in addition to the virtual world through what they're pulling in through the cameras, even though you can't see the real world. So like another way to get to seeing the real world through a headset that blocks your view. So we've talked about a myriad of choices there, and you can see a huge range of costs across the AR and VR possibilities from as low as $5 up to $10,000 for a suit that you could wear while you're doing VR that um, will be able to track everywhere that your arms and legs are moving instead of just your hands and head, as well as it provides a whole bunch of other uh, features to be able to make you feel hot or cold or to make it feel like things are touching your arms or legs as well. And um, I'm going to say that this is a very, very, very tiny sliver of all the choices that are out there for hardware. So it's kind of just showing the range, but there are lots of other devices there. Um, some of them you can see on the list here, like the Google Daydream um, was kind of one where the phone was built into the device already instead of having to slide it in. That got discontinued, and I think the same as the other kind of very low end headsets. Um, just because the mid-range got a lot cheaper. Um, and before this mid-range came out, you were um, looking at the at least around $900 range before. And now that the mid-range is down to the $300 range, um, people probably don't want those three degrees of freedom as much. Um, the PlayStation VR, um, the second version is expected soon. I actually was checking it this morning to make sure it hadn't come out. Um, it looks like they may have revised from 2022 to 23 for what they mean by soon. Um, also, rumors are that the next uh, headset from Meta that's codenamed Cambria might come out in September or October. 
in time um, for the Christmas season. It's also rumored that it might be more focused on enterprises um, than the Quest, which is solidly focused on consumers and not enterprises. I think it's important when you think about what it's going to be the uh, cost of your your headset that it's not always the case that going further down the list and price to more expensive is better because it's really only worth spending that money if those things that they're better, the features they're adding, the better features, whether it's eye tracking or better view or whatever, are features that your organization needs. So if you could meet all your needs with the, the Quest, then no reason to get the Vive. Um, you may find that within your organization, um, you can't standardize on only the Quest because it would be sufficient for both most needs, but some things that you need to train need a higher one. And so you might define some levels, like we're gonna use this for all the training that we need to do where it makes sense. But if we have these needs that we need to meet, we're gonna have a smaller set of headsets um, for that type of need. Um, so our, our training did use the Quest 2, um, and I'm gonna move next over to the development tool. So what types of development tools might we want to use for AR and VR? So you've probably heard people mention Unity or Unreal as choices, but those aren't the only choices that could be used. So here is a chart for augmented reality showing tool categories divided by capability and complexity. The goal of this type of chart is to make sure that the tools are at the right level of capability for the problem we're trying to solve. And we want to make sure that we have resources who are skilled enough for the complexity that comes with that capability. So for the authoring category here, these are tools that um, an instructional designers would be able to use. If we want to use tools over here, Unity or Unreal or ARKit or ARCore, these are things that we would need an experienced programmer in order to be able to use. Next, a uh, similar chart, but we've moved from augmented reality to virtual reality. Um, here are quite a number of tools at a level that would be appropriate for instructional designers to use, or even 360 video type of things, just shooting that. Um, and then towards the higher end, um, WebXR for scripting or Unity uh, or Unreal for programming. So um, one of the reasons why AR and VR get lumped together a lot is because although the headsets are somewhat different, the tools that you would use to make it at the high end are, are the same. So a formatter, this would be somebody who really doesn't need any experience. They can uh, maybe spend a few minutes learning the tool and jump in. An author, this is where it's going to probably take some time to learn how to use the tool. If you if you think about traditional e learning, this would be a tool like Storyline or Captivate, but it's those other tools from the chart for VR where you would need to spend some time to get familiar, but then you'd be able to create AR or VR with those types of tools. Um, a scripter. So this would be someone who can write code at the level of JavaScript and then a programmer. Someone, um, often they might have a computer science degree, they might know a tool like C Sharp or C++, and they have familiarity with those game engines like Unreal or Unity. And the, the, what the game engine provides is really the physics so that if you pick something up in the virtual environment and you drop it or throw it, that you don't have to program it to make it fall um, or bounce off of things, the game engine has that part built in. So for our aseptic best practices training, we needed lots of custom interactivity to do those things like track the walking speed, the hand movement speed, and alert the learner if they weren't holding their hands in the right way. So we knew that we needed a programming tool and experienced programmers to be able to pull this off. We wouldn't be able to do it with one of the simpler tools. Then we got down to a decision between Unity and Unreal, which of those is gonna be best in this case. When you consider that trade-off between Unity and Unreal, the Unreal engine is going to provide the capability for the utmost level of graphics, that Hollywood level style of graphics. But if you don't need that, and we found in our case, we didn't need that to have effective training, then you would probably wanna go with Unity because C-sharp code that's used in Unity is easier to maintain than C++ code. Um, and 
on top of that, so the kind of frameworks and functionality available for AR and VR, Unity is a little bit further ahead than Unreal in terms of having an ecosystem of that type of support built into their tool. But that being said, Unreal certainly also is capable of being used for developing AR and VR at the high end. All right, we've reached the point where we've selected the platform. Um, once we build the app, how do we get it distributed out to our learners? And the fact that we had that Quest 2 made it pretty tricky because um, at that time, Facebook had really focused their ecosystem only on consumers, as I mentioned before. And so it's not easy to get stuff distributed out to learners who don't have a Facebook account. A couple of ways that you could get around this. One is a tool called SideQuest. Um, this requires having the headset connected to a computer and the end user who is using the headset needs to be able to load things onto the device. The, the SideQuest store allows you to publicly or privately post things up into the store. But the drawback of this is, is along with the apps that you're trying to get out there for training, that, that user who's going to use that to load is going to see all sorts of other stuff out there related to games and entertainment, um, some of which might not be appropriate for an organization, uh, some of which might have mail, malware in it, perhaps, because it's not as vetted as thoroughly. So SideQuest, I think, is a reasonable risk for an end user, a home user, but not good for an enterprise user. Next is Microsoft Intune. Um, which IT departments like because they already have it for um, managing their Android devices. But the support for some of the headsets like the Quest is quite limited with Microsoft Intune. Next, there was a brief time when there was an Oculus for Business, but uh, this was discontinued by Facebook before they became Meta. Uh, presumably, they're eventually going to offer a replacement for this. Maybe when that Cambria headset comes out, they'll come back with one that's more meant for enterprises. And then in our case, we ended up piloting with a service called Arbor XR, which manages a variety of different AR and VR headsets. Um, the Arbor XR system would allow us to update apps, and the next time the headsets connect to Wi-Fi, it will automatically push the new version of the app to them. It also allows us to control what experience the learners have on the device. So, for instance, if we have loaded up a few apps that learners are supposed to take, we can keep them from even knowing that there are any other apps or finding other apps on the device. They can only launch the ones that we've set up for them to launch. Um, and we can expose to them the ability to set up Wi-Fi or do casting, but not to get back to the overall management of the device other than the types of things they really need in order to do training. Um, here you can see a screen where we've got a few headsets set up into a group. And here we've loaded in an app. And again, when the devices connect, if we update from version 1 to 1.1 of the experience, um, all of our headsets distributed out across the globe will get that new version pushed down to them quickly the next time they connect to Wi-Fi. So now we've developed the app. We push it out to the learner's headset. Now we need to figure out how we're going to track progress. So we could use AICC and SCORM for tracking traditional e-learning and potentially for some uh, AR or VR things. But really for um, AR or VR, we want to use something like XAPI instead because SCORM and AICC are really meant to be launched from a learning management system and just track completion and, uh, and score. And with XAPI or Experience API, um, we can launch the training from everywhere. We can start the experience and the headset. And not only can we track completion and score, but we can have a log of all the things happen. So we could, at the end of the experience, show the learner walk fast three times in these spots, and um, they touch their hand to their gown or to some equipment when they weren't supposed to. Um, that sort of stuff we can log there. SCORM AICC is readily available. Um, it may provide some support for tracking, but it will not provide the detailed logging. And depending on your management system, it may not work at all with AR or VR. 
X, X API learning record store, you're going to be able to log any information. Um, one thing is, is that you may not get built in reports with a learning record store. Um, the learning record store is going to track what you did, but you may need a system, a separate system for being able to report or have dashboards. You could track to a proprietary or custom database, um, but you would have no limit on what gets tracked, but very costly. Um, and then once you get all that tracking data in to the learning record store, you could figure out how am I going to report on this? Um, I could have a learning analytics platform that's bundled on top of the learning record store. I could integrate and send data over to standard BI tools like uh, Microsoft Power BI. We could have a proprietary system for reporting and dashboards, but very expensive unless what you're reporting is very simple, you'll be ended up re recreating the functionality that is in other tools. Um, so in our case, uh, we went with the XAPI Learning Record Store, and, and um, we use a system called Watershed, which bundles the Learning Analytics Platform, or LAP, with the Learning Record Store. And we're, we're piloting with that now and continuing to evaluate, uh, but that is providing what we need for reports. So in summary, um, the challenge for AR and VR is often not how hard it is the technology, but it's the missing or incomplete strategy. You've got to work backwards and forwards to figure out a lot of other things about your organization in order to figure out what you need for the technology part. The decisions that we want to make strategically to make sure that we're setting up for AR and VR for the long term, the level of realism, the hardware selection, the development tool selection, how are we going to distribute our applications, and how are we going to do the tracking and reporting so that the learner and uh, their managers will be able to see what it is that they've done. And in order to make those decisions strategically, you're going to really need to connect to those parts of the overall learning strategy, the vision, the audience, the delivery methods, how you're going to procure things, the assessment and evaluation, and the organizational structure. So for there, I wanna to go to questions. Happy to answer any questions that you might have if you don't have time for them now. Uh, my contact information is on the screen and I invite you to reach out to us with questions, thoughts, or comments. Um, also from the knowledge menu on our website, you will be able to find our Let's Talk uh, Learning Technology podcast that Walter and I co-host. Uh, Walter, if you'll put that link into the chat too. Um, we're getting ready to, we got a number of episodes out there and getting ready to release an exciting one about advanced storyline tips. Uh, thank you for your help, Walter. Uh, thanks to our marketing director for helping me along the way. And thank you all so much for attending. I was glad, I'm glad you're here and I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>